Well, hey, this is John, and I'm glad to be with you. I'm the founder of Wake Up or Else. We're a 508C1 private ministerial association, and we're an online Christian fellowship for the truther community. You can see our scheduled services down in the bottom right of your screen. And we've been providing a biblical analysis of the Mandela effect for about seven years now. This talk today is called the seven Mandela effect questions that the unconvinced cannot answer, thereby proving that the Bible is supernaturally changing. So we also do these different live streams from time to time. We have the scheduled meetings down in the corner there, Recovery Fellowship, Training on American State and National, Living in the Private, and we have a Truther Fellowship every Friday at 7. So just come on out. Don't be a stranger. All right, if you haven't done so yet, Head over to Amazon, pick up a copy of my new book. It's called The Conspiracy Theorist Survival Guide. You know, because we're all taking it on the chin. Once you find out things are fake, those around you aren't happy with you. Also want to thank all those supporting us financially. Your donations are going a long way to helping me continue to bring this very difficult and challenging message to our brothers and sisters, I can assure you. They seem to want to ignore this like the plague. <laughs> so if the Lord puts it on your heart to join us uh, financially, you can go to wakeuporelse.com, click the donate link, or just click the link down below. All right, and so uh, this is going to be a rather lengthy topic today. It's not something I can really deal with in sound bites, so I've provided a, tro a topical timeline in the notes section below so you can just skip directly to different parts. Like if you want to go to just the questions, you'll be able to do that. All right. Father, I just ask you for your help in bringing this difficult topic to the forefront. I ask you for your help. I ask you for your anointing. I ask you for your wisdom. And I ask you for those that will hear, to have ears to hear in Jesus' name. So over the last seven years, it's pretty evident that the majority of Christians and church leaders will tell you emphatically that it would be impossible for the Mandela effect to supernaturally change the scriptures. And so this doctrine of providential preservation and the accuracy and inerrancy of scripture is looked upon as just so sacrosanct. It's just so fortified by what seems to be unambiguous scriptural support that in many cases most church leaders will make it clear that the topic is not really even open for discussion. I mean the impression I get is you know the suggestion that some parlor trick cooked up by the devil could possibly override the eternal decrees of the Almighty is so offensive and repugnant that it will typically generate a flurry of ad hominem attacks. And these rebukes will be shrouded in the most solemn zeal for the house of God. But I would submit that this zeal is really a smokescreen to cover up willful ignorance towards our evidence, a lack of any serious research, and a fear of losing one's reputation and financial security. It is very much like what Paul said in Romans 10, Verse 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The perception among the unconvinced is if the Mandela effect is actually causing the words of the pages of all Bibles in the entire world to supernaturally change, then that would have to mean that God had gone back on his word and could no longer be trusted. If this is happening, then God's a liar. Well, I can tell you with 100% certainty that it is happening and it, God is not a liar. So that's some good news, if there is such a thing in this. So in addition to passages that seem to clearly indicate that the Bible could not possibly succumb to an attack of this nature, the unconvinced also draw their, from the observations that seem to indicate that God is ordering events so as to preserve the Holy Scriptures. So the teachings themselves that you find in Scripture are known as doctrines of accuracy and inerrancy, 
But then the idea that God is ordering events to protect Scripture is re typically referred to as providential preservation. So in this talk, I tend to pose seven questions that seem to contradict this long-held position. The seven questions will provide, I believe, very compelling evidence, if not irrefutable, that in fact it is being changed regardless of any apparent arguments to the contrary. And I will not convince you of that. You will admit that yourself when you answer the questions honestly. It will be up to each individual on how they're going to deal with the undeniable conclusions that you will be forced to draw. Difficult conclusions, like the apparent biblical paradoxes that this phenomenon most certainly creates, the incredibly dire consequences of this event, the conflict in your soul between the duty to warn others and the concern that the revelation of our Bible, having become compromised, will cause people to backslide. It's extremely disruptive, this event. And of course, the paralyzing fear of losing your reputation and your ministry if you go public once you've been convinced that this is actually happening. I mean, imagine telling the district or your overseers that you're going to tell everybody from the pulpit on Sunday that the Bible's supernaturally changing by the devil. <laughs> it's like, it's a deal breaker. Now, I myself personally embrace the unchallengeable authority of Scripture above all other spiritual writings throughout history. And it's claimed to represent the final word of what is true in regards to the duty of man and the character of God. It is God's word to me. It is the words of God. It is not a, a book of literature. It's not a book penned by men. And so there is no argument <clears throat> or philosophy that can exalt itself above the authority of scriptures to establish what is true regarding the things of God or the afterlife. I believe, however, that in the light of the Mandel effect, only the original autographs as delivered and recorded by the original authors can be considered immutable, immutable and unchanging. What was given to them is unchanging and still binding upon all humanity, even if it has changed and become inaccessible. And most Christians, however, are implacable when it comes to the idea that the Bible could be changing. They're, they appear fortified behind like a hundred foot wall called the Bible can't change. But is it possible that they are mistaken? Could this position be inaccurate? Of course it's possible. Of course, because no Bible believer, church leader, pastor, or influencer can argue the fact that the interpretation of certain passages, major doctrines, have fallen under great debate throughout the centuries since the Bible has been canonized. Personally, on numerous occasions, I've witnessed men of God that have reached the patriarchal status while they yet lived debating the two sides of a biblical topic, such as Calvinism, the deity of Christ, salvation by faith alone versus a holiness wall, Christ, the, the King James only debate. These debates were held between some of the most devout learned men I've ever seen, and they couldn't come to an agreement on what the scriptures were actually teaching. So if men or women at this level couldn't agree on the clear meaning of what the Bible was saying, then it is certainly a possibility that the church is misunderstanding the teachings of Scripture on this topic. For instance, the terms Scripture and the terms, the term Word of God are typically used interchangeably, but they're not the same. Based on this observation alone, you must admit that it is least possible that the 1% to 2% of Christians claiming that their Bibles are being supernaturally changed are correct, and the 98% of the body of Christ is incorrect. It's a possibility. And it is with that openness that I invite you to examine the seven questions that I will post to you in a moment. But before I do, let me offer one additional observation. 
And that is that it is clear that if the church was to reluctantly embrace the evidence and then publicly concede that this was taking place, it would be one of the most disruptive events in the entire church age since the birth, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now it's clear throughout history that God finds it necessary on rare occasions to completely disrupt either the flow of history or the trajectory of the church at that time. So examples of these uncharacteristic incursions by God are the Great Flood or the Tower of Babel. These were very uncharacteristic interventions by God where he exhibits the willingness to interrupt free will more than he usually does. Sort of like the prime directive in Star Trek where they don't fiddle with civilizations until they've reached the ability to travel at light speed. So God doesn't typically come in and stir the pot like he did with the uh, flood or the Tower of Babel, but <clears throat> we also see certain individuals who were raised up throughout history to bring a revelation to the church or to its enemies that were extremely disruptive to the status quo of that day. So Martin Luther certainly comes to mind. He received the revelation of salvation by faith alone that drove a stake into the heart of the Catholic dogma of salvation through observing the sacraments. And then there were many biblical pa uh, patriarchs that risked their skin to bring a stern warning to the power structure of their days. Samuel rebuked King Saul for his unlawful sacrifice. Nathan rebuked King David for his adultery. And of course, Ezra rebuked the men of Judah for marrying idolatrous women. And these were men and women that brought the truth of what God really thought and wanted at that time and had the courage to deliver it without fear or favor of man. They were not swayed by the probable ramifications of their obedience. And examples of these were Daniel, who was thrown to the lion's den, and the three Hebrew boys that were thrown to the fiery furnace. And so it's clear now that we find ourselves in the midst of yet another one of these grand interventions by God. Except this time, it's going unnoticed by 98% of the people that it's intended for. But this is by design. The supernatural Bible changes are a test to see if the church actually knows him or do they just know their Bibles. We read in Isaiah 1.3, even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care, but Israel doesn't know its master. And through, throughout history, we see that God has exhibited this tendency to try to draw us out of ourselves, to reveal to us the condition of our hearts, or to prove our fitness for some task. Now, I believe this passage encapsulates the reason that God is allowing the enemy to fiddle with the Bible. This passage here in Luke 24, 28. Here we see Jesus sort of playing hard to get. He's drawing back. He's allowing his clear voice to no longer be heard through the Bible changes to put a fire under us so that we'll press in and, and constrain him and say, abide with me. Luke 24, 28, and they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And now this is Jesus. And he made as though he would have gone further. He pretended like he was going to go further to see what their response would be. But they constrained him, saying, abide with us. Jeremiah 2, 13, my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me for their Bibles, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, Bible studies galore, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now, it might seem counterintuitive that the Bible could become a cistern that holds no water, but just ask the Pharisees how all their head knowledge worked for them. A lot of Christians have replaced knowing and obeying him with a substitute called head knowledge. They mistake knowing the scriptures with knowing him. 
It's like the person that joins the gym but never goes. I've done it. <clears throat> we feel better about ourselves because we have the membership. But as a result, we can't bring ourselves to cancel it, even though we haven't been to the gym for over a year. So that's like our Bible knowledge is like the gym membership, even though we haven't visited with God in over a year. It's a substitute. It's an idol. So this test of the supernatural Bible changes is very similar to the test that was given to Abraham when God commanded him to sacrifice his son. God knew that in the future, he would deliver to Moses the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, and the imperative in, Le in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that his people should not offer their children as sacrifices to God as the pagans did to their god Moloch. So God was, in this test, God was commanding Abraham to do something that seemed to violate God's own preferences, even though he had not formally established those yet. It was obvious to Abraham that this was, let's just say, unusual. It was a test, though, and God was requiring Abraham to have to look past any previous writings regarding God or any previous experiences that Abraham had been through and trust in his knowledge of who God was and his voice. Abraham was required to rely on his intuition and his experiential knowledge of who God was. It required him to rely on his own confidence that he was able to hear God's voice correctly. Oh, was that just me that said, go sacrifice my son? No, he knew it was God's voice. And then he sensed that it was to asking him to do something that was wrong. And so he did it. He was forced to trust in the God that he knew, regardless of the circumstances. And so from this example, it appears, I think this is a fair evaluation, that God, in rare occasions, is willing to risk being perceived as unrighteous to test his servants from time to time. Job's wife certainly had that impression with what Job went through. But see, Job was steadfast. He said, shall we not receive good and evil from the hand of the Lord? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Those were his wreck. Those were Job's, how Job reconciled it. He refused to hold God in derision, regardless of what the appearance was. So my thesis is that this is exactly what is happening with the Mandela effect, changing the Bible. Just like Abraham and Job were tested by being forced to accept something that made God seem unjust. So, in a similar way, we are being tested by having to accept the Bible changing, even though it might make God seem unjust. Okay, so with that understanding, I submit the following. Here's the seven questions. If you believe that the Bible is not supernaturally changing, but you cannot provide this community with a reasonable, rational answer to the following seven questions, then you will tacitly be admitting that there is, in fact, some sort of phenomenon that has taken place. And by doing so, you will be forever relinquishing the luxury of being able to ever suggest that what we are testifying to can be easily explained away by simple, run-of-the-mill, everyday misremembering. In this video, I intend to completely eviscerate the misremembering argument once and for all. And by doing so, I take away the unconvinced primary and really the only rational explanation for our testimony. And so I intend to apply searing logic to your obvious, to me, willful ignorance and force you into admitting what is clearly taking place. I believe that you will be forced to concede that this is a phenomenon by these questions. But I also believe that because you stand to lose your ministry, if you publicly acknowledge the authenticity of this event, you will probably decide to refuse to acknowledge that the phenomenon must be explained by the fact that the scriptures are changing. And if you do that, 
but offer no alternative explanation, then I, for one, am going to insist that you provide an alternate explanation for the phenomenon. If you're unable or unwilling to do that, then I will insist further that you never, ever utter the term misremembering, confabulation, implanted thought, charlatan, deceiver, wolf in sheep's clothing, false prophet, or conspiracy theorist in my presence ever again. Because I will have proven that we are not misremembering or any of those things. But instead, it is you, dear soul, that is miscategorizing us. Additionally, you will not be able, moving forward, to continue to lecture us in a condescending tone that we are simply biblically illiterate. We will not tolerate being categorized as internet buffoons that are unworthy of any serious consideration. No, my ability to present questions based on verifiable observations that you are unable to answer removes any moral authority that you have to suggest that we are deceived charlatans spreading deceit and doubt in the body of Christ. If we have ruled out misremembering, mental illness, demonic delusion, implanted thoughts, and government psyops, the only thing left is a phenomenon. And therefore, with all of those out of the way, these questions prove unequivocally that the Bible is changing. Or at the very least, that something exotic is happening. Now, we may not know what it is, but we know what it isn't. It isn't misremembering. Because here, this is what our community has observed over the last seven years. First of all, the majority of preachers and pastors, church leaders, influencers, have said absolutely nothing regarding this fulfillment of end times prophecy. And this is even after we've approached them with our research. The few that have spoken up have almost without exception ignored the evidence that we are presenting and instead simply brought their own set of proofs from their own echo chamber to bear on this controversy. And by doing so, they are engaging in willful ignorance and ignorance of the evidence that has convinced all of us that something unexplainable is truly happening. Millions, according to my research, now claim to see this as a phenomenon. And we see the church leader's blindness as only explainable as some sort of bewitchment. You seem to us to be under some sort of spell. That's the only explanation we can come up with with how blind you are to this. So the following seven questions are going to require you to respond directly to our evidence because our position is very simple. Almost all of us believed that the Bible couldn't change until we saw that it was changing. And so we concluded that if it is changing, well, the Bible must not be teaching that it can't change because God doesn't lie. We have the same reasoning you do. We don't believe God is a liar. We believe the scriptures are inspired. We believe the original autographs are immutable. But the evidence is so clear that we would have to violate our conscience to come to any other conclusion. So before I do give you the seven questions, however, let me just first say that my argument is either good or it's bad. I don't believe, for instance, having a PhD after your name means that what you say is more right than what I'm saying. So appeals to authority are a bad argument. I don't need a four-year degree from some seminary to sell, tell when someone is avoiding the truth. So the idea that someone is not allowed to have an opinion unless they have approval from some established institution is not convincing. And the idea that you have some superior grasp of how to interpret the Bible because you have credentials or that you're more properly exegeting the Bible than I am or that you're suggesting that I'm taking things out of context, they're just a smokescreen to cover up your own egregious lack of integrity for ignoring what these questions are pointing to. If you don't have an answer to these questions, then there is a phenomenon. And if it's not misremembering, the phenomenon eradicates all of your biblical knowledge that you have about how this can possibly be happening eradicates it. 
I mean, you pound the pulpit in righteous indignation against what you see as heresy while you flagrantly ignore the evidence that we provide for you that proves you're wrong. Is what, what I see in, in a lot of cases is I've been in ministry for 10, almost 11 years full time and 20 years in lay ministry. I've been in the church for three decades in the ministry, not tending church, on the platform, leading worship, pastoring. And, and so I've been in and around Christians and I've seen that many are drawn away from God into a distorted cerebral head knowledge type of religion that is just harsh and devoid of life. I mean, the Catholic Church is a great example of this kind of sleight of hand type of religious construct where they draw you in and it seduces you into a kind of a, it's like a labyrinth. It's very complex and it's esoteric. <clears throat> All this exalted knowledge that you have to master in order to feel as though you've attained sainthood. Oh, yes, my grandmother, she went to Mass seven days a week. She was a saint. No, she was just grinding out a, a religion by works. You know, Jesus' last words were, it is finished. So she was really wasting her time. The Gnostics, of course, seek to acquire secret knowledge in the pursuit of becoming an ascended master, but you can't point to one ascended energy being that's floating around in Nirvana that used to be a mere mortal. They don't exist. It's a lie. Okay, the daughter of the founder of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, testified that her father's last words on his deathbed were, oh no, something's wrong. So if anybody gave it the Gnostic thing, the old college try it was old Anton. So this accumulation of knowledge combined very often with self-flagellation is very appealing to the natural mind. It's a lot easier than the dealings of God in your heart. It's the old, you can be God if you get enough knowledge pitch that we heard in the Garden of Eden from the serpent himself. It's exactly the same thing coming out of the minds of the Illuminati and their mouths. So this self-abasement thing, this comes from like a misguided striving to be accepted by God instead of a love motive because you've already been accepted by him. And you know you didn't deserve it, so you're just smitten. And, and so the true saint turns over his food bowl in fasting from a, a cry for more intimacy <clears throat> with the one that's already accepted him, whereas the misguided soul is driven by a performance-based acceptance. And fasting is like self-flagellating, self-punishing yourself to get God's approval. And many professing Christians view their understanding of the Bible, church attendance, Bible study, reading their devotional as sort of a notch on their belt that wins God's approval. They have secret sin, but they rationalize, hey, their church attendance and command of scriptures kind of balances it out. God knows I'm in the game, you know? No. No, if you think I'm exaggerating, just look at average Christians in persecuted countries where they might have one page of the Bible. But they're going out and they're getting converts and they're healing the sick and they're getting the blind to see and they're raising the dead, <clears throat> right? When's the last time you raised the dead? Would you even consider that? The kingdom of God is not in word, but is in power. So it, it's quite apparent that we have hewn out cisterns that hold no water. And so God is in his mercy is removing the Bible, so to speak. So we will become desperate for him. Like when he pretended he would go fall farther and they constrained him. And you just read Amos 8 and see that prophecy about the famine of the word. See if that does not perfectly describe this Mandela effect. But many are going to ignore the evidence presented in this talk in an attempt to sidestep the elephant in the room, the elephant that is sitting on the head of all your high sounding arguments and your vacuous theological indignation. You are a farce and a liar, sir, ma'am, unless you can give this community a straight answer to the questions I'm going to pose. 
I beg you, stop lying to yourself and everyone that you have influence over by suggesting that the Bible is not being supernaturally changed. A 10 year old would be able to easily respond to these questions that I have. So it should certainly be within your capacity to do so. And so my observation is that if you can't offer an explanation, but you insist on maintaining your Bible can't change position, then you are the liar and the de delusional mind control victim, not us. If you can't answer these questions, yet you persist on propagating the idea that there is some sort of force field around this terrestrial book, then you have set yourself to oppose the truth and make yourself the enemy of God's word, not the protector of it. You are the one leading people astray and God is going to have his way with you for your insolence and your decision to turn a blind eye to the evidence that he is placing in front of your recalcitrant face today. Or worse, you do, you do know this is happening. We know this is the case. And you decide not to warn your followers out of some misplaced sense of duty to protect them. This is outrageous. There is no plausible scenario that you can describe to any of us that would include aligning yourself with a conspiracy to covertly corrupt the Bible to deceive God's people. How do you justify that? The, the ridiculous reasoning is similar to someone that knows people are asleep in a burning building, but you decide not to say anything because you don't want to upset them. You're afraid they might get scared when they have to run for their lives. So you're just going to let them burn alive. What about the, the more serious danger that you are exacerbating by your silence? The danger that they will continue to swallow the twisted picture that is emerging of our God and his ways in our sacred texts, which is undeniable. I mean, how bizarre and unlike God do these passages have to get before you will stop trying to gloss over these wildly unfamiliar and often passages that create biblical paradoxes and try to suggest that it's just a bad translation. You're violating your conscience in front of us by ignoring your certainty when you remember it differently than what is in your Bible. And we're adults. We know what misremembering is like. This is nothing like that. As I'm going to prove unequivocally here in a second. Because then you try to explain it away this glaring memory failure by looking at the concordance and, and then trying to reinterpret what the English words are playing. Well, let me clear this up, John. I can tell you what the what it means. It's just a bad translation. And how far are you going to take that argument? What if this is in all Bibles, but what even if it was just one mainstream version, NIV or NAS or whatever, and all of a sudden, it says Jesus drove into Nazareth in his Honda Accord, drinking a mocha latte that he got at Starbucks. Those were the words that now appear in a Bible. Would it matter what the underlying Greek or Hebrew said? No. The change would be so overt, you wouldn't be able to provide cover for the devil anymore and become what I call commentary man. You put on your cape and you come and save the day but you're violating your own conscience and your own intuition. Certainty is a faculty of the soul given to you by your creator. Certainty, sir. And when we ask pastors who laid down with a the lamb, they say, oh, a lion. It's self-evident. That's certainty. That's what drives human behavior. But not to fear. He keeps it just subtle enough so that you can keep convincing yourself that it's not happening and go along with it. Now, the words on the pages are changing and you're going to have to deal with it. And you may have convinced yourself that keeping this from your followers is the right thing to do because you believe that, you know, protecting them from backsliding is a good idea. Let's keep it from them. But I know this is true because I've talked to men of God that have made that decision. And I think if you search your heart, you'll find that what you're really engaged in is just a de desperate attempt at self-preservation for your reputation and your financial security. And so you are being tested as the rich young ruler was, 
And dear soul, you are going down in flames on this one. If you know this is happening and you remain silent, then you have abdicated your mantle as a shepherd and you are nothing more than a hireling. I would not want to be you on Judgment Day as the accuser of the brethren points to you and says, this one was a co-conspirator with me to deceive your, his flock that you entrusted with him, God. And so because of your cowardice, they all take the mark. And why wouldn't they, right? Everything to convince them that they should take the mark is going to be in their Bibles that you're endorsing. Now instead, I would invite you to join our little band of persecuted heretics. And you can wander around in sheepskins as, as we are, be the off-scouring of the world as we are, over here on the fringe of society where Jesus is. Maybe God will put you into something like the Hebrews 11 Hall of Faith that he'll have in heaven. So I can assure you, if you're going to be guided by your integrity to the only possible conclusion that these questions will inexorably lead you to, then you will have to be willing to lose everything if you will have any hope of coming to the correct conclusion. You're going to have to be willing to lose everything like I did. You are blinded by a sacred cow and... You don't know the hour of your visitation. This is a judgment of God, and it's happening right now. He's removing the lampstand of his word from the earth. And just like there's no more opportunity to repent when you land in hell, it's similar to that right now. A similar thing is happening. So the words of Revelation 22 are being fulfilled in your hearing. What we're told in the, the previous part of this passage, I believe, speaks directly to the Mandela effect. Because one interpretation is, it says, do not protect the Bible from Satan. And then it says this, let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. So what this means, I believe, is as this phenomenon progresses... Without the clear testimony of Scripture, men will be at a great disadvantage to find their way to God. And they'll be set in their, set in their ways as a result of it. And I've heard many uh, people I've talked to decry the suggestion that this could possibly be happening simply on the grounds that the ramifications of it would be so dire that God would never allow it. But it's God's judgment on you for being a Pharisee. It's supposed to be terrible. And I'm not just talking to you. I'm convicted of that myself. I, I found myself treating the Bible as a self-help book. In other words, I had problems. And the reason I had problems is because I didn't have enough information. So I would go to the Bible to get more information to fix my problems. But that's not the walk that we're on. The walk is described as put on Christ. It's a relational book. The Bible is a doorway to him. It's a prayer guide. It's all relational. So if you choose to sidestep and ignore the obvious conclusions that these questions will demand and continue to cast your unresearched aspersions on this community from your rarefied perch of spiritual superiority, then I would invite you to back up your bellicose bloviations by accepting a 90-minute invitation to a debate. I have found that almost all invitations to public debate on this topic are avoided like the plague. And I don't believe this is because church leaders are too busy or they don't want to dignify this topic by showing up. I believe it's because they sense that there is meat on the bones of this argument and they're afraid. I believe deep in your heart you know that this is happening, but you don't want it to be happening. And so instead of putting on your big boy pants and coming out into the open, you just sit back behind your pulpit and throw rocks from a distance like a 10-year-old. You should be ashamed of yourself. I have someone very competent that will be our moderator. I will send you the debate guidelines that we will both be subject to. It'll be very fair and loving, right? Timothy said the, doc 
The goal of our faith is love from a pure heart. I'm not out to crush anybody publicly or demean you. I am you. But you can come out of the shadows and into the city gates and defend the position that you so vociferously proclaim to be true. So you can contact me here at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. Send me an email with your contact and we'll set up a debate at your earliest convenience. Or you can just contact me for a conversation one on one. And if you do come in a debate, if you're correct, as you feel you are, you're going to have the opportunity to rescue thousands of us that are wallowing in this deception as you see it. Okay, so let's get to the questions. The first and primary argument that is put forth by the unconvinced is that this whole phenomenon is just an exaggeration of everyday run of the mill misremembering. We're just exaggerating what's happened for centuries. I have had countless well meaning men and women of God patronize me by just glibly stating that they can clear this whole thing up for me. They are cavalier and condescending, and they proceed to provide a variety of examples of how unreliable the human memory is. And we're endlessly told that the human memory can't be trusted. I mean, listening to this defense, you would think that the entire human race is born with dementia from day one, that we're all incapable of remembering how to tie our shoes. So this, of course, is not our experience. And so it's proven to be a lie from inception. And, you know, we're accused of simply not knowing the scriptures and that we're getting our doctrine from the Internet, whatever that means. I, I mean, I'm sure the people making that accusation use Blue Letter Bible or Bible Hub. So they're getting their doctrine from the Internet, just like we are. I mean, I've got a stack of Bibles on my desk here if you'd like to see them. And it's just, just a small example of the superficial reductionist arguments that are hurled our way by otherwise rational learned men and women of God. They're, they're baseless accusations. Okay, and this idea that the human memory is unreliable is a baseless argument. It isn't true. And you can, I will sweep it aside with one simple observation. Okay, and here's question number one. If God commands us to remember eight different times in the Bible, would you agree that that is a strong indication that the human memory is extremely reliable over long periods of time? Yes or no? No commentary, just yes or no. I'm going to read it again. If God commands you to remember, would God command you to do something that you are incapable of doing? Yes, I agree. The human memory would have to be reliable if God commands us to remember. Now, if your answer is no, please explain why in the comments section. Okay, and just here, here they are. Here's eight different times God commands you to remember or states it in a way that you should be able to remember. I'm not going to read all these. <clears throat> you shall remember the Lord your God. Well, if if I'm as senile as the unconvinced would have me believe, this would be impossible. And I just don't think God would do that. <clears throat> okay, so there's eight different commands to remember. And then, of course, we have long term memory studies, where after almost 50 years, people were able to remember 80% of verbal and 70% of, of visual. <laughs> the, the, the National Library of Medicine disagrees with you and states that human memory is highly accurate and largely indelible. And then, of course, 18 U.S. 3502 is a law, which is the admissibility of memory or eyewitness testimony. That means if it's admissible as evidence, that means literally it is trustworthy. It is reliable. That's what that word means. Evidence. Just to recap, if you said yes, eight commands by God to remember would have to indicate the human memory is reliable. That means you now agree that human memory is reliable. You no longer are taking the position that 
the human memory can't be trusted. And you're able to slough this off with that lame observation, which has nothing to do with reality. Now, in a similar way, the unconvinced try to suggest that the unimaginably large number of people all having a very large number of unfamiliar vivid memories is nothing out of the ordinary. And they seek to categorize this experience as natural, and whereas we categorize it as a phenomenon. This is really the crux of this debate. Can it be explained and understood with rational, rational explanation, or is it a phenomenon? So the unconvinced tries to suggest that this is just the same quantity of remembering that has gone on for centuries among human civilization. And their position is that there's nothing to see here, move along. But all of this is really just an unresearched Hail Mary that has nothing to do with reality. We're told that just because you get mixed up on a few scriptures doesn't mean reality is changing. Really sarcastic. Well, with all due respect, you know, we're told this is just the hysteria of a few crazy people in their mom's basement that's being amplified by the Internet. I've heard that a hundred times. It's a few crazy people in their mom's basement trafficking in the dark corners of the Internet, and then it's amplified by the Internet. This is total nonsense. Let me demonstrate how far from the truth this idea really is with question number two. Okay? If your name is Tom and you wake up one morning and now your name is Tim, would you characterize that as a phenomenon? Okay, so here's the scenario. Your name is Tom and you wake up one morning and now your name is Tim. All of your bank statements, all of your documents, your license, all going back to birth, all say Tim. Everybody that you know knows you as Tim. So you first go and you seek medical help and you have a, a psych eval and the good news is you receive a clean bill of health, so you're able to rule out some sort of medical condition or mental illness. There's nothing like that in this scenario. So then you just to be thorough. You go visit your pastor after a lengthy conversation. You're relieved to hear that in his expert opinion, you're not under, under any kind of demonic delusion. So you've ruled out the possibility that you're experiencing either a mental illness or a psychosis or a demonic delusion and you don't use drugs or alcohol. That is my hypothetical scenario. And so the memory that you have of your name, though, is so vivid that the God-given faculty, now listen, the God-given faculty of certainty, which is a, an emotional state, does not allow you to violate your conscience by simply relegating this experience to the idea that you're just somehow mistaken. This is an outrageous abdication of your being, okay? It's destroying your conscience by doing this. Turning your back on yourself. Oh, I'm just mistaken. My name must have been Tim. My documents sure say it. No, the voice of certainty within you says, I don't care what the data sphere says. I know what my name is my entire life, okay? I don't know how it's changed, but I know my name is Tom. It's not Tim, okay? Period. All right, so here is my question, dear soul. If you found yourself in that situation, would you categorize that experience as an unexplainable phenomenon, yes or no? Yes, John, it would be a phenomenon. Or no, it's not a phenomenon, and here's why. Would you categorize what I just described as an unexplainable phenomenon? Of course, I think you would have to conclude that it was a phenomenon if you have integrity. So just to summarize, if you answered yes to question one, then you agree that the human memory is reliable. And if you've answered yes, it is a phenomenon to number two, then you also agree that we are not experiencing misremembering. You agree that there would be no rational naturalistic explanation for that experience, and you agree that it would be a phenomenon. And that's the same as our Mandela effect experience, because many of the memories, not all of them, that we're claiming, the, these memories that are no longer as we remember them, are as vivid as our names. 
So they can no longer be dismissed as risk misremembering that if our very names had changed and you just agreed with me. You just agreed that what we're experiencing is not misremembering and that it's a phenomenon if you answered yes to question number two. Let me illustrate a little further so you'll understand. If you meet someone at an office party and you mistakenly call him Jim because his name's actually John and he corrects you, oh no, I'm John. Oh yeah, John, that's misremembering. But if you go visit your aging parent and they don't recognize you, this is your own mother, Oh, who are you? That's not everyday run of the mill misremembering. I think you'd agree. You would, you would have to say, well, why is that happening? Well, she must have mental illness. So you would assign a, a very serious condition to her brain for her to be exhibiting that kind of behavior. That's a catastrophic memory failure. I think you would agree that someone exhibiting dementia is more akin to the phenomenon of waking up one day and your name has changed, like I described in this example. If you experience something on par with your name changing, it could only be described as either a catastrophic memory failure or a phenomenon. So if you rule out mental illness, then the only thing left is a phenomenon, not misremembering. Okay, and so this brings us to question number three. Question number three, is going to be my opus. This is irrefutable, what I'm about to show you. I call this the doctor, the pilot, and the pastor. Okay, I'm gonna give you a hypothetical situation and then ask you what your expectation is. And please remember that you are answering in the presence of the Holy Spirit, so please be honest and innocent in your answers as you can. Okay, the doctor, the pilot, and the pastor. And the question very simply is, why does the pastor get all 10 wrong every time? All right, so there's a commercial airline pilot. This is your background. He's flown in the military for 10 years with a distinguished record. He's then flown for one commercial airlines for 20 years. His record is so impeccable that he is now a trainer of other pilots. He's just had a physical and a psych exam. He's in perfect mental and physical health and he does not use drugs. Now, what do you think the result would be if you were to give the pilot a quiz of 10 basic instrument questions, asking him to simply identify the name of the instrument? That's it. What's the instrument that allows you to fly level? The gyroscope or whatever it's called. So my question to set this up is first of all, what is your expectation? How many questions out of 10 simple instrument questions would he get right? 10 simple instrument questions, just to identify the instrument. How many do you believe he would get right? Now, if your answer is 10 out of 10, because that's what everyone says, you would be in the majority. But if not, please explain why you don't believe he would get 10 out of 10. All right, next you have the doctor, and the doctor was in res residency for 10 years, and now he's had a practice for 20 years. His record is so sterling, and what he's accomplished, he is now chief of staff at the hospital. He also just had a physical and has no mental illness. He does not drink or use drugs. Now, if you were to ask the doctor 10 basic anatomy questions, like, what's the name of the organ that covers the outside of the human body? Answer, the epidermis. Very simple anatomy questions like that. How many do you think the doctor would get right if you asked him 10 basic anatomy questions? Is your answer 10 out of 10? Because that's what most people say. And if it's not, please explain why. Finally, you have a King James only pastor. He graduated from seminary. He's been in full-time ministry for 30 years, just like the other two professionals. And he is now the president of the Bible school, and he's world renowned for his command of the scriptures. He only reads the King James Version, and you are asking him questions from the King James Version. So there's no possibility of him confusing what you are asking him with other translations, because he doesn't read other translations. It's not a modernization, because you're quoting from the Cambridge 1769 version that was the last version that had any major modernizations. So any anomalies or misanswers can't be 
as a result of a modernization. In other words, his Bible has been changed from the one that he used to read or something like that. He too has had a recent psych eval. He's in sound mind and he does not use drugs. So if you were to test his memory by asking him to fill in the blanks for 10 basic Bible scriptures, not stuff out of the book of Ezekiel or obscure passages. I'm talking, you know, judge not, blank ye be judged. Fill in the blank, pastor. Simple, basic, familiar Bible passages. How many do you think out of 10 questions would he get correct? Is your answer 10 out of 10? Because that's what most people say. And if it's not, please explain why. Now, the observable, repeatable, undeniable reality is what the doctor, the doctor would get 10 right out of 10, the pilot would get 10 right, and the pastor will get 10 wrong. Every time, maybe nine or 10, maybe nine. Sometimes they'll get one because now the changes have been around for a little while and they're starting to learn the changes. But up until now, it's been 10 out of 10 with 100 out of 100 pastors. Now, the proof that this observation is true uh, is going to be at the end. I'm going to give you a website to go to where there's 20 Bible questions and you can do this yourself and keep your own score. But for now, for the sake of time, let's just say that that observation is true and that's happening because it is. And so my question number three is how is that possible? How is it that the doctor gets 10 right, the pilot gets 10 right, and the pastor gets 10 wrong? Okay. And keep in mind, this is not just one isolated scripture. It's 10, but it's way more than that. It's 30, 40, or 50. We can consistently stump seasoned pastors with very familiar passages. How is that possible? How is it possible? It's not a Bible translation confusion. It's not a modernization because it's all King James. Just to give you some contrast so you can see how obvious this is, if you were to ask the pilot in this example the 10 basic instrument questions and he got them all wrong, what conclusion would you draw? You'd have to, you'd have to draw the conclusion that he's lost his mind or somehow, right? But in my hypothetical scenario, he hasn't lost his mind. I told you, he had a psych eval and he's got a perfect bill of health. He has no mental illness or psychosis and he's not on drugs. So if it's not mental illness, how do you explain him not being able to identify 10 out of 10 of the instruments? His memory failure is so catastrophic he would be incapable of continuing as a pilot. And this, would, this event would also indicate that something catastrophic has recently happened to him because he would have been unable to function as he had for the last 30 years if he was unable to identify 10 basic instrument questions. So his inability to answer correctly would absolutely indicate something has changed. Things are not as they've been, but in this example, You've already ruled out mental illness or incapacity of some kind. So it would have to be something outside of himself, something in his surroundings. And the same would be true with the doctor and the same is true with the pastor. But our observation is that the pastors are exhibiting this catastrophic memory failure. They are getting 10 wrong and we could do it with every pastor. And the fact that it's repeatable with every pastor has to rule out mental illness or dementia because you would then have to suggest that all pastors everywhere have simultaneously been stricken with dementia, which of course is not true. Now, maybe as I've turned this over and over in your mind and looked at this from different angles, it has given you some flash of inspiration. So I'm going to pose the question to you one last time in the hopes that you'll be able to answer me and rescue me and hundreds of thousands of devout Christians from our delusion. If the pilot or the doctor gets 10 out of 10 wrong and it's not mental illness, then what would be the cause of that? Is there any rational explanation that you can offer as to why the pilot and the doctor would get 10 out of 10 wrong?
because they're the same as the pastor. They're content experts in their chosen vocation. You can't offer a reductionist argument now. I've put you in the corner. It's many well-meaning, learned men and women of God have arrogantly scoffed at me, stating such a thing is impossible. And I ask, well, it sounds as though you have all the mysteries of the universe figured out. Is that correct? So I'm going to give you a little more time to try to search and grope through the recesses of your limited human intellect and try to come up with some rational explanation why a pilot or a doctor would get all 10 simple quiz questions wrong, just like the pastor, without resorting to the idea that they're misremembering or having a breakdown. There isn't anything. You can't come up with anything because there isn't anything left except a phenomenon. And so as a community, we have reached out in thousands of different encounters with our pastors. I've heard from thousands of people over the last seven years who have reached out to their pastors only to have our meetings cut short, been demeaned, been dismissed, told we have a demon, or that we need medication by arrogant church leaders who refuse to lift a finger to look into this phenomenon. And if I don't paint you into a corner with these questions and force you out into the open, that must mean you're able to provide some simple explanation for what we're experiencing, and you'll be able to easily dispatch my wild ramblings with sound logic. And so in an effort to save myself from this delusion that you say that I'm under, I'm calling for learned men and women of God to come forward and have a debate with me so you can lead us out of this great deception. I'm appealing to your nobler motive. Have compassion on us. The Bible says that we are to condescend to the lowly. That's us. I'm appealing to your zeal as well for the house of God. And as an ambassador of Christ, that you have a duty to God to defend the scriptures. I mean, if I'm wrong, I am certainly, I am certainly the enemy of God, if I'm wrong. But I'm willing to be wrong. So if I am wrong, I want to know it. I don't want to go to hell as God's, you know, spreading deceit among the body of Christ? Certainly not. So please come and debate me. Because I'm saying unequivocally that your Bible that is sitting on your desk, sir, ma'am, the Bible that's in the attic, the Gutenberg Bible that grandma had, changed to fulfill end times prophecy. And I'm proving it with my questions. And you're saying that's impossible. And so my challenge to you is if you truly believe that, then come forward and engage me in public debate right now. Do it today. I'll be checking my email at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com, and I'll be looking at the posts for anyone with an intelligent response that I will then respond to. But in the absence of that, the only explanation that I can come up with that would explain why a doctor or a pilot or a pastor would suddenly be incapable of answering 10 basic questions that is not caused by mental illness or misremembering would be that either they have transferred somehow to a parallel universe where all the instruments, anatomy names, or scriptures are different, or their reality timelines and constructs that they're in now have somehow morphed and the instruments, anatomy names, and scriptures have changed, or there is some sort of consciousness shift that has maybe caused false memories to be implanted in all of humanity, where the instruments, anatomy names, are, and scriptures have always been the way they are now, but somehow we have vivid memories to the contrary, or there may be some other exotic explanation, but I can't think of any. Now, you're probably unaware of this, but Enoch actually described this event perfectly in, a, in the 80th chapter of his book, the book of Enoch. Enoch chapter 80, verse 2, In the days of the sinners, the years will be shortened. 
their seed shall be tardy on the lands. And then it says this, and all things on the earth shall alter and shall not appear in their time. So this change that we perceive goes all the way back to the beginning. I very often will see the unconvinced try to argue that because Matthew Henry is talking about the wolf laying down with the lamb or dwelling with the lamb in, in his day, that that's proof that we're mismer No, you don't understand how exotic this phenomenon is. When we perceive a change, it means that that is how it's always been in this timeline. It's a different timeline. <laughs> and here is Enoch telling you, all things on the earth shall alter and shall not appear in their time. You need to be a little bit more of a supernaturalist, dear soul. The rain shall be kept back and the heavens shall withhold it. And listen to this. And in those times, the fruits of the earth shall be backward and shall not grow in their time. I'm going to show you an example of that. And then it says this, and the fruits of the trees shall be withheld and the moon shall alter her order. Check this out. Okay, this is how bananas grow. This is how they've always grown and all species grow up. However, that looks very foreign to most people. And we have here an example of residual evidence from a f documentary on Cuba from the 1960s. And we don't understand how we get residual evidence, how it slips through or remains in this timeline. But there are bunches of bananas where they're growing down as we all remember them. And then, as Enoch pointed out, what did he say? He said, the moon shall alter her order. Okay, so here is NASA's um, description of the phases of the moon, waxing crescent and waning crescent. You'll see that the partially illuminated moon is either going from the north to the south pole along the right side or from the north to the south pole along the left side. Those are the phases of the moon. Now, what did Enoch say was going to happen? The moon shall alter her order. Okay, now you can go and try this out yourself. This is now what we're seeing when we look up and see the moon in that crescent. It is now pointing down to the south. And the moon shall alter her order. Ha, ha, ha. So you can't have it both ways, dear soul. If you don't have an answer for us, then you can't suggest that this type of experience would either be misremembering or dementia. That door has now been closed. That lame, unresearched, pathetic Hail Mary has been summarily dismissed. And frankly, I would appreciate an apology from the clergy for all the name calling that we've endured from our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ for the last seven years. So the conclusion that I draw from this observation in question three is that the probability that every Christian and pastor, which includes you, by the way, would simultaneously been experiencing catastrophic memory failure from some naturalistic reasons is zero. Therefore, it must be a phenomenon. What all Christians and pastors are exhibiting by getting so many things wrong during a fill in the blanks memory quiz is a phenomenon. It is not misremembering. That's my statement. And if you don't have an answer to the questions, one, two, three, then you, and you're still calling me names and telling me I'm crazy and blah, 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 then you're just a liar. All right, moving to question four. Okay, question four is, how is the telephone game possible? So this is why I'm asking this. In my experience, I sit down with the pastor, and I'm always able to present simple Bible questions that any third-year Bible school student would be able to answer, but the pastor will always get them all wrong, all of them. Then I ask him the Dr. Pilot pastor question, and when I ask them, how is this possible, they don't have an answer. But once in a while, I will get the same answer that I've gotten, about seven or eight times now. This is the only other answer I've gotten. They'll suggest 
that it's caused by something similar to the telephone game. Well, have you ever heard of the telephone game, John? Okay, so let's just say for a moment that this is this breathtakingly preposterous joke of a suggestion could possibly be true with just one scripture. Do you honestly believe that you could get a hundred reasonable men to agree with you that this could happen with 40 or 50 different scriptures? But let's just look at one. So you got the guy, you know, 50 years ago, John, some pastor just misquoted and he said the lion will lay down with the lamb and that went through the whole world like the telephone game. So the second person changes a little bit. The lion came down with the lamb. Then the next guy, the lion came down with some ham. And then the next one, the lion's name is Sam. And then it ends up completely shifting to the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Okay. Okay. You want to go with that Hail Mary response. Let's let's really think about this. Because if you're going to suggest that the telephone game is the answer to question number three, why don't why did the pastor get 10 wrong? Well, the telephone game. Well, explain how the one influence of a single song or a preacher misquoting a scripture approximately 50 years ago could possibly overcome the variety, the repetition, and the greater strength of the greater number of influences. Of as many as eight different sources that a Christian are subject to on a regular basis. In other words, how does the guy misquoting it 50 years ago overcome me reading the Bible and listening to the Bible every day? Okay, so here you got the guy, whoever he is, and he says, this is like 50 years ago from the pulpit somewhere. He says, judge not lest ye be judged. Now that wording does not exist in any Bible translation and never has. Judge not lest ye be judged is on the lips of saint and sinner alike. The entire world quotes this incorrectly. Okay, and the definition of influence is the power to change or affect someone or something. So in this graphic, you have one man misquotes a scripture. But then on the other side of that, overcoming that influence is the Christian's Bible reading and their attempt to memorize the Bible and then their practice of meditating on the Bible and then their days in children's church and the spiritual books that they read, which have scriptures in it and the recordings that they listen to and their daily devotional that they read and then they go to church and they hear other men speak the scripture matthew 7 1 and then of course they attend bible studies where they study matthew 7 and all of those influences are overcome by one song or one man somewhere along the way misquoting it how is that possible? How is it possible that the one man quoting it has overcome all of these different influences that are happening over and over? I mean, he was a one off. He only said it once and somehow maybe it got repeated through whatever media by a little bit, but nothing like the daily practices and disciplines of our faith. So if you don't have an answer for this observation, then you are tacitly agreeing that this observation is yet another proof that this is a phenomenon. Now, keep in mind, how does this happen not with one scripture, but with many? Because you have many passages that are vividly familiar that don't exist anymore. So you would have to try to make the case that this one-off has happened 40 or 50 times, not just once. That's a tall wall to climb, dear soul. So if your answer to this question number four is, I don't know, then you are at least admitting again that the experience that we're reporting is not misremembering implanted thoughts, confabulation, or any other naturalistic explanation, it can only be explained in one way, it's a phenomenon. 
Okay, and this brings me to my next question, which I feel is irrefutable truth or irrefutable evidence that the Bible is supernaturally changing. If it is a phenomenon, but the Bible isn't changing, then what is the phenomenon? Okay, so in other words, if, I have, if I've succeeded in eliminating any naturalistic explanation, which I believe I have, you'll have to let me know, and you agree that it's a phenomenon, then please explain where or how the phenomenon is taking place. So if you're going to stick to your guns, the Bible's not changing, but you do agree it's a phenomenon, my question is, well, explain to me how it's happening. Because the unconvinced have all the same memories as those claiming that this is a phenomenon. So if you agree now that it's a phenomenon and we all have the same memories, but you don't believe the Bible's changing, then where is the phenomenon manifesting itself? How does this work? How logistically, specifically, are we deceived and you are not deceived? If you agree that it's a phenomenon, how? How is it a phenomenon? It's not that one group is, is psychotic. You know, they're seeing things that aren't there, like pink elephants in the room. Because that would mean you're psychotic as well, because you have the same memories as us. We remember mirror, mirror on the wall, and so do you. We remember Grand Central Station, and so do you. We remember lying, laying down with the lamb, and so do you. But if it's a phenomenon, what is it? At the center of this debate is the conclusion that everyone comes to based on the experience. We're all having a catastrophic memory failure, and then the unconvinced are jumping off and trying to claim it's just no, you know, natural, it's just misremembering, and then we're saying, no, this is, this is completely a phenomenon. Well, now, if you're agreeing with me that it's a phenomenon, you're gonna have to explain how the phenomenon works, and if you don't have an explanation, then you're conflicted. You've got a big problem because this is an, a doctrinal atom bomb. I totally admit it. I mean, I agree with you. But I'm not going to make myself smarter than God. I don't think you should either. Now, I think that what I presented up to this point is compelling, but it cannot hold a candle to the next question. I have saved the best to last. I believe what I'm about to ask you is the strongest proof that there is a phenomenon taking place. And if you were to ask me, what is the strongest piece of evidence that the Mandela effect is really happening? It would be this question. What is a flip-flop in the context of the Mandela effect and how did we experience this? Now, if you don't know what a flip-flop is, in the context of the Mandela effect phenomenon, then you have obviously not done your research and your ability to properly evaluate this phenomenon is critically compromised. You also have zero credibility to suggest that we're deceived if you can't explain what this is and give a rational, rational explanation for it. Flip-flops eliminate the argument of misremembering because it's an experience where the entire community watched something very familiar change. We all made videos about them, and then we watched them change back again. They flip-flopped. So it's almost like we literally saw it change real time. Now, there are testimonies of that, too. I've seen videos where people had Bibles that were brand new pages, and then half of them were old pages. I've seen words that were fading and changing. I mean, this is really happening. Now, what's bizarre about this flip-flop thing is we all made these videos about the change. I did. But then all of those videos that we created just vanished in this new timeline, and there's only residual breadcrumbs of our previous timeline and our memories. Now, I, I actually have one of those breadcrumbs, or what we call residual evidence, myself, that I created in the initial change when it flipped, I created a video on Chuck E. Cheese's and I took a picture that I'm going to show you that is impossible to explain in the present timeline because now we flipped back again. Okay, so the flip-flops 
that the entire community observed and documented were the Flintstones. We woke up one day and it was Flintstones, which makes no sense because everything in Flintstones has to do with rocks. Barney Rubble, Mr. Slate, Flint is a rock. So Flynn is, is, is ridiculous, okay? But that's a lot of Mandela effects are like that. They don't make any sense. But then, I don't remember how long later it was, six months, something like that, a year. It flipped back again. And we were all talking about the first one, and now it's flipped back. And we were like, this is absolutely happening. This is unequivocal proof. If you were there with us in that time, and if you were involved, you would have seen it too. Next one was Houston, we have a problem. Now, this is specifically the Tom Hanks movie line. I, there's controversy around this. The original recording was different. Blah, blah. We're just talking about the Tom Hanks movie line. Then his, then that movie line, we, I remember watching it, and he was saying, we've had a problem. Houston, we've had a problem. And I'm like, no way. It was Houston, we have a problem. Well, then it switched back again. And that's what it is now. Houston, we have a problem. That's what Tom Hanks says now. But there was a period of time where you could go to YouTube, put in that thing, and it would come up, and you would, you would have seen Tom Hanks saying, Houston, we've had a problem. Okay? Tidy Cats became Tidy Cat, and then it flipped back again, and then Chuck E. Cheese became Chuck E. Cheese's, and then it flipped back again. So there's been four documented flip-flops. There may have been some other ones, but those are the ones that really stand out. So in this question... My question is, how did our community experience observing these? Are, are we just seeing things? Okay. How did we all witness this happen in real time? Keep in mind, it wasn't just virtual. Many of us saw these things changed in the stores. I did during the first shift. It was changed in the real world, not just Photoshop tricks. Sorry. I think that your only argument here is that a million of us got together and somehow coordinated to all lie in unison. That would be your only possible rebuttal to this, that we're all just liars. Because if we're not lying, then there doesn't seem to be any explanation except for a phenomenon. So if you're claiming we're deceived, you're going to have to explain how we're deceived. Otherwise, you are exhibiting dictionary definition of delusion, which is you believe what's wrong and then you're resistant to facts. I am presenting you with unequivocal proof or evidence. This is empirical evidence, and I'm drawing conclusions. And if you're just brushing them aside and saying, well, I don't care what observations you make, the Bible can't change, then you're delusion. You're resistant to facts. And you know what? God is very into facts. Because facts are truth. Facts are... Truth is defined as what is factual, and facts are defined as what is obvious. And what is obvious is that these things that I'm showing you happened, and then our conclusions are obvious. So if you, if you refuse to allow your your uh, doctrine to be challenged by God, then you're delusional. Okay, the testimony that we all observed and recorded, flip-flops, are facts and evidence. And the Bible says, in the mouth of two or more witnesses, let all things be established. So if you don't have an answer, please, you know, at least say, John, hey, I don't have an answer. I'm not convinced yet, but, I, you know, at least from this, I, I think I can understand why you might be. How about you throw me that bone? You know, just throw me a bone. Okay, but I'm not just going by our testimony. Okay, Flintstones became Flintstones. There's some residual evidence. And then this was residual evidence that I got in that first shift when it went from Houston, we have a problem, to Houston, we had a problem. This is a website that shows you commonly misquoted movie lines. And I took this image during the first time shift when it changed to Houston, we've had a problem. If you look at the bottom, 
it says the misquote is, Houston, we have a problem. Well, during that timeline, that would have been correct because it had just changed to Houston, we've had a problem. But now it's switched back. So now it's incorrect. <laughs> and again, we're just talking about the Tom Hanks quote from the movie only. So we're not confused, okay? We've done our homework, all right? We are not confused about what we're talking about. Tidy Cats changed, dropped its S. That's very common. S's go away. I don't know where they go and they come back. So you can see here, this is from uh, newspapers.com. It's a, a residual evidence, Tidy Cat, and then Tidy Cat. You see this, uh, hundreds of these examples. You can offer whatever uh, kind of explanation you want. I'll listen to it, but, you know, there's a scientific discipline called probabilities, and after a certain point, it's like, come on. All right, but this one's the one I'm going to show you, the residual. And Chuck E. Cheese is how we all remember it. And then we all woke up one day, and now it's Chuck E. Cheese's. I mean, the words just fall out of your mouth wrong, and we're like, no way, no way. This, this is absolutely a Bible change or a, a Mandela effect. And here's it kind of in between these two periods, we see stuff like this, where the data sphere is in the process of changing over. The shift is not complete all, all the time right away. Sometimes there's kind of a little bit of a gradual or a lag. So you can see both Chuck E. Cheese and Chuck E. Cheese's. Now, if you read the, the history, the company did change its name. So you could just cite it as that. Okay, however, I'm just asking you in this question, how is it possible that we saw this happen? Okay, but the last question I have is this, is how could I have a picture of Chuck E. Cheese from 2020 based on the present timeline? Okay, so here is the present timeline. I just checked it today and this is still correct. So according to this reality and, and Wikipedia and their website, I'll just use the Wikipedia because it's correct with their website. Uh, it was Showbiz Time Inc., which began unifying the two brands, remaining every location, Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza. It was later shortened to Chuck E. Cheese's in 1994 and Chuck E. Cheese in 2019. So according to history right now, the name of this company changed to Chuck E. Cheese in 2019. So we should not see anything that says Chuck E. Cheese is after 2019, if that's correct, okay? But as I told you, I made a video about this when the shift happened the first time and the date was February 18th, 2020. And you can see in this Wikipedia shot here the history timeline here is they redesigned the logo in 1994, dropping pizza from each store's name. So it was Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza. They redesigned the logo in 94 and dropped pizza from the store's name. That means that the name as of 1994 was Chuck E. Cheese's. Okay, so in the present timeline, it's saying what it's saying here in this one that I took in February 2020, but there's no mention of them then dropping the apostrophe S. Okay. So here it says the same thing. It was shortened to Chuck E. Cheese's in 94. That's what the other one said. But then it says, and Chuck E. Cheese in 2019. So that's the present timeline. So I should not have any mention of Chuck E. Cheese's after 2019. And as you can see, this is the timestamp from my computer for this picture of Wikipedia that I took on February 18th, 2020. There's the timestamp. We could do a forensic analysis of my computer. You would be able to confirm that this is not fake. And th so this is showing you that I have an image from late February 2020 
showing the company name as Chuck E. Cheese's, which according to the present timeline should be impossible because according to the present timeline, it changed to Chuck E. Cheese in 2019. You know, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't possibly give you any more concrete proof that something unexplainable is happening than that. So you'd have to just say I'm a liar in order to sidestep this piece of evidence. Is it a phenomenon? Why are millions of people claiming this experience? What's causing them to make these claims? What is driving so many people to make such an outrageous claim that the major media is forced to cover this? I mean, I've researched the number of people claiming this and it's in the millions. There's almost 100 groups just on Facebook and then you have all the other social media channels YouTube, Rumble, you I mean, it's all over. The Mandela effect is being covered by major news outlets. They're making movies about it. And you have all these major publications coming out, doing full spreads on this phenomenon. Sorry, seven questions. So the last one was, how could I possibly have a picture of Chuck E. Cheese cheeses in the from 2020 when the company wasn't called that then. All right, so I'm closing here. These are the next steps for you. I told you I would give you an opportunity to test this yourself. So we'll prove number three is correct that pastors are getting most wrong. Go to wake. I'm sorry. Go to hardestbiblequiz.com. And there's a quiz there where you'll get the answer right away. As soon as you answer the question, it'll tell you whether you're right or wrong. And there's 20 of them. And just keep score yourself. OK, on that page, you can also visit a video archive that I have there for pastors with uh, a number of different videos that you can look at to give you further inf information on this biblical analysis of the Mandela effect. You'll find out how this could be happening without diminishing God's divine perfections in any way. And then my, my request is just please contact me. Send me your your phone. I'll call you. We'll have a conversation. And if you'd like to have a debate, just reach out by please wake up or else at gmail.com. And I will gladly set that up so we can get to the bottom of this. Thank you for listening. God bless.